Welcome to All Things Moore County, Moore County's weekly radio show highlighting the many facets of the Sand Hills. That includes real estate, lifestyles, community, and neighborhoods. And now, from four properties, here's your host, Bill Sahadi. Good morning, and welcome to the uh, talk show, All Things Moore County. It is election season, and we talked earlier on some other shows about the opportunity to have a chance to speak with some of the candidates, some of the issues that voters will be looking at when they go to the polls on November the 6th. Um, Interestingly enough, um, early voting started um, this past Wednesday, the 17th of October, and I went over to the Douglas Community Center and voted. And when I pulled up my car, I thought it was election day. Um, that's how well developed it is. Right now there are uh, two places in Moore County where you can do early voting. Uh, one is the Douglas Community Center in Southern Pines, and the other is the Moore County Board of Elections in Carthage. Um, and I understand that voting, uh, from what I hear, um, 50 to 60 percent or up even as high as 70 percent of the people who are going to vote are going to vote early this year and um, it was very good to see such a strong turnout we're going to be speaking this morning with um, Frank McNeil um, who is running for Congress and um, he is uh, a Moore County native um, but he's running in the 8th congressional district which comprises um, a large portion of the southern Piedmont area of North Carolina from Concord to Spring Lake, including China Grove, Albemarle, Troy, Pinehurst, and Rayford. Um, Frank was a guest on our show um, earlier this year, just before the primaries, which you um, performed very well in and won, uh, was it 50, 60 percent of the vote? Had 56 percent of the vote and the other two split the 44. So now that you're in the general election, 56% would sound pretty good, wouldn't it? It would be wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit about the last couple of months, the experience you've had, because now that you're running in the general election, you've been an elected official in Moore County, but never at this level. Correct. Yeah, I served uh, as mayor of Aberdeen. That's right. uh, On the town board before that, and later served on the Moore County School Board. And so um, all the elective office have been here local before. Um, you started out with a, um, a statement. I just want to read it. Um, um, it says you're running for the North Carolina's 8th Congressional District to bring North Carolina values of decency, kindness, and hard work to Washington. Um, while your opponent is both bought and funded by Washington donors, um, you're up against a, um, a financial uh, juggernaut, and no matter how you slice it if you don't have the money or you don't have the monies to compete it's awfully hard to be on a level playing field it, it certainly is money has just ruined washington yeah and talking with people that's one of their uh biggest concerns or or biggest frustrations is just the way that that congress doesn't seem to function right the way that we all think it ought to function and Special interest money just has a stranglehold on uh, on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, and it it pr- prohibits them from working together and getting things accomplished. Good for for all of us, the citizens. Mm-hmm. Something's got to be done with campaign finance reform. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mark Twain once said, uh, "Is I'm opposed to millionaires in principle, but it would be dangerous to offer me the position." Right, and so. You know, when you're running as a uh, challenger, you don't have the access to the resources. Once you get in there, all of a sudden, yeah, you're on the inside, and it's uh, to your advantage. So it it kind of discourages from wanting to uh, to change the system, but it, it needs to change. It, it's just uh, just ruining the ability for Congress to to work together. Gotcha. Um, on the ground, in you talking to different people. Um, do you find that in North Carolina, um, whatever is happening at the national level is trickling down into the state, and is it uh, getting involved in your race? Or in North Carolina, are people just focused on the local issues, and they're kind of divorced from what's happening in Washington? No, I think I think what's in the in the news is on people's mind, okay, and and certainly affects them. 
So um, turnout is going to be very important. Um, I, I would guess, I think there are 60, uh, 39 candidates running in um, our local elections. And if I'm not mistaken, nine or 10 of them are Democrats. Um, so Democrats need uh, the turnout. Correct. Um, are you finding that people are more energized because of what's happening on the national stage? And, and is that trickling down? And because that's really something you, that's an engine you need. Absolutely. Very much so. Yeah. Traditionally, Democrats do not turn out in the off presidential years. And so that hurts us in the, uh, in the local races and, of course, in the congressional races. Mm -hmm. This year, there seems to be a lot more excitement and a lot more enthusiasm. What do you think the um, effect has been about the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation hearing process? A lot of people are saying that that actually um, will energize the Republican base. I think it may some. I think the whole spectacle, again, has just reinforced with people how dysfunctional it is in, in Washington. Yeah. Uh, when you're interviewing... Uh, a candidate like like Kavanaugh, there's no reason not to be civil mm -hmm. and and uh, and respectful of each other. That was not and the I, case, and it was not the case. And I think we saw that practically every senator there, right? You know that there was an anger and and, and a meanness, right? Uh, back and forth from both sides, right. And it doesn't have to be that way. Right. And I think as long as we keep sending the exact same people back that are doing it now, it's going to continue. Yeah. I'd love to see a lot of new faces in Washington. Yeah. The um one of the one of the claims that you've made in your your campaign is that your opponent is a DC insider. A and as dysfunctional as Washington is and has been mm -hmm. for many years, not just since 2016, right? Oh no, it's it's been going back decades. A, a long time, right? Correct. I mean, you go back to the 90s and you can just see people falling off the cliff. But today, what what specifically backs up your claim about your opponent being a D.C. Um, insider? Well, he has been in, in D.C. his whole working life, yeah. uh, working as a staffer, working with, with other congressmen before he ran, came back in, uh, ran for Congress. I think it changes your perspective. And uh, I use example, if you grow up... Uh, pulling for North Carolina, right? or you grow up pulling for state, that's two entirely different perspectives. right? And so my life experience has been in the private sector, operated a small business. right? I've been involved in local government, right? been involved in the community here right. in Moore County, right. church, civic activities. Yeah. And so it does shape your outlook on, on issues. It shapes your outlook on how you make decisions. At this stage in your life, um, why are you doing this? I mean, there's there's a lot of dysfunction you're you're putting your feet into, right? <laughs> it is, and uh, you know, it's, it's not a very attractive position right now because of that. But I think I can truly make a difference. Right. I can't by myself. But again, if we get a lot of new faces of people that aren't just tied into the the, the pettiness and the meanness of Washington, we can make a change, and we've got to. Our country cannot afford for us to continue to go in the direction we're going. Right. When you were here uh, in the spring before the primary, I used to watch. I would watch the news. I've stopped doing that. I don't watch anymore. I can't. I can't stand it uh, from both sides, and it's blasted, and you're being screamed at, and um, it's offensive. Um, I will tell you there's a local race, and I remain unnamed, in North Carolina, and every week I get a mailer. Mm -hmm. And it's a big color brochure. It's a two-sided mailer. And um, it is the kind of rhetoric <clears throat> that you hear on TV that emanates from Washington where it's appealing to the lowest common denominator mm -hmm. of people who are just looking to grab onto sound bites. Stuff is not true. It's completely misrepresented, um, and um, I look at it, I shake my head, and I just throw it away. Um, and in a million years, if I didn't, I would never vote for that candidate just because of what right. they're doing. And um, 
it, it's sickening. Well, I think you, you've really hit on something there. The negativity of campaigning, and the reason it's done is because it works. Yeah, it does work. It's, if we, the voters, could change that immediately, if we would quit voting for people that simply attack with negative and oftentimes, as you mentioned, untruthful or mm -hmm. distorted mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. they'd quit because the politicians do whatever it takes to get elected. Yeah. And, and if we keep falling for it, they'll continue to do it. But what do you say to the voters who are just so tired of all the BS? And, you know, every once in a while someone comes along like yourself and does have a great message. How much of it is really heard? Without a lot of money yeah. to put it out. On right. the radio and television right. and, and mailings, like you say, yeah. uh, it is very difficult. You know, I travel around and meet people one-on-one, -on -one, but there's 750,000 people in the district. You That's can only right. meet so many people That's right. personally. And so That's right. it's so important to be able to, uh, to get the message out through media. Talk a little bit, um, what are the top issues in your campaign that people who might not have had a chance to meet you or see you, what do they need to know about your stances on the issues that are most important to you? Well, we, we've talked about trying to change the culture in Washington. And unless we do that, nothing else is going to be accomplished. Right. Beyond that, health care is a real concern to me. Uh, insurance is getting so expensive that it's too many people are having to simply not buy it because they simply can't afford it. And it really puts themselves at risk. One area that, let me back up, when the Affordable Care Act came out, the purpose was to insure everyone, which was a great idea. The thing it didn't do was look at trying to control the cost mm -hmm. of health care. Prescription drug costs are just going through the roof. Right. The government is prohibited by law from negotiating. Medicare cannot negotiate with the drug companies over the cost of prescription medication. Congress could change that immediately, and I would certainly support that. I've got a cousin that takes uh, two injections a month for rheumatoid arthritis. When he started eight years ago, it was $900 a month for the medication. Today, it's $4,900 a month, eight years later. Wow. Same drug. I mean, what? what's the, uh, and of course, his own Medicare. Right. So we, the taxpayers, through, our, uh, through Medicare, are paying for all but $250 a month of that. And so that's an area that we need to very much uh, try to attack. There's no reason for a medication to cost more here than it does anywhere in the world, particularly if it's made here. What side of the um, spectrum is your, is Hudson on um, on affordable health care that differs from you? Well, of course, he has voted every time to just do away with affordable, the, the ACA. And then the message was, well, we got something better. Well, they've been talking about it for eight years, and nothing has been uh, even proposed. The Affordable Care Act, excuse me, the Affordable Care Act, it needs some fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. If your uh, attitude is either don't touch it or do away with it, mm -hmm. that's not working to, to improve it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, on the, the pre-exist conditions, uh, that's one of the things he's, uh, by uh, doing away with the Affordable Care Act, would be eliminated. The pre-existing conditions to where an insurance company cannot discriminate mm -hmm. against someone is critically important. So on someone with diabetes, he says if the ACA goes away, or if that provision in the ACA goes away of pre-existing conditions, I cannot buy insurance at any cost. <clears throat> and so the health care is, is, is a big issue that we really need to address. As our um, population is getting older, right, and there's a demand for for health care, and uh, so many people can't afford the, the prices that are being put in front of them. Now you're hearing talk, and I don't know if it's just talk, about <clears throat> cuts in Medicare, cuts in Social Security. These are not; these were programs that were not ever part of the budget. Right. But now they're being bantered around to, um, um, to offset some of the, the fiscal uh, irresponsibility that's been going on. Well, they 
they aren't part of the operating budget, but the funding has always been intermingled. Right. And for years, Social Security has been running a surplus. And, of course, the, the design was that it would build up a, a nice account because when us baby boomers mm-hmm. hit, met, hit Social Security, mm-hmm. it was going to start running a deficit. Mm-hmm. Great idea. You put money into the mm-hmm. account, and then you draw it down when the big baby boomer bubble hits. That's right. The problem is they invested their money into treasury bills the safest way to invest that money. Mm -hmm. And so when the government in the operating budget was running a deficit, they would borrow the money from Social Security through Treasury bills. But accounting, they would run them both together. And so you had a combined. Mm -hmm. And so if Social Social Security had a $200 billion surplus, the uh, operating budget was $600 billion in the hole, Mm -hmm. put them together and say, oh, we had a $400 billion deficit last year. And so there is no money put away. It's, and that's why they would look anywhere to cut to try to uh, bring down the deficit. Yeah, um, um, a big posi- um, a benchmark of your campaign is, um, and one of your slogans is North Carolina values. Right. So, what does that mean to the voters in the eighth district? Are they more concerned with provincial issues, or are they looking at the national scene and? Uh, emotionally reacting I think we all care about issues that affect us directly locally and so uh, that would be the the main concern on people's mind and the main interest but of course national things are affecting locally like you mentioned the potential to maybe cut back Mm -hmm. on Social Security or Medicare Mm -hmm. you may not even cut back but if you don't allow increases with inflation then it's similar to a cutback mm-hmm. the you know the eighth district runs from federal to concord and so you've got a large population area in federal you've got a large population area in concord well in between it's just kind of rural north carolina right and so we as north carolinians i think are used to treating people with respect kindness uh, decency, we 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 respect each other. That has not happened for years in D.C. I think part of the problem goes back to when the members used to move to Washington. They lived there. Their families would visit with each other on weekends. Their children played together. Mm-hmm. The wives got to know each other. Uh-huh. You developed a relationship, a personal friendship. Now, you might be on opposite sides of the aisle, but still... It was your friend on the other side. Right. And you were able to work together. If you had a disagreement, you could talk about it, right. negotiate, and compromise, and come up with something that worked. When you talk like that, about that, I think of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. Right. Always. They were friends. They were um, obviously on opposite sides of a lot of issues. But um, they liked each other, and they worked through, they worked through things. Right. And even further back, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Everett Dirksen. Yeah. The leaders of the Senate, great friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about um, you know because of the the funding, which is so important to get out there. You have to have a sophisticated ground game. And what is what does that look like? <laughs> what does that mean? It means you get out and knock on volunteers. We have yeah. to have a large cadre of volunteers that go out and knock on doors mm-hmm. and hand out material and then try to educate the voter that way, mm-hmm. making phone calls, uh, texting, and so uh, doing some mailing. But it it takes a tremendous amount of volunteers yep. and a lot of elbow grease, yeah. but it doesn't take the large millions of dollars that a, uh, a massive TV campaign would do. Right. You do have some um, TV ads that are coming out? We do. We've uh, got one started just today, and we're run, just running on the local cable here in the district. Uh-huh. Um, when you look back in 20 years, um, you, this is your first national election, mm-hmm. but this is a historic election because the, these particular midterms seem so pivotal for so many reasons. Um, that no matter what happens, um, when people look back at the 2018 elections, um, they're gonna, it's going to be a bellwether election. 
Um, I guess the turnout is the most important um, uh, dictator for um, the ability to flip right. a district. Um, and there's a lot of talk about that. Um, but in North Carolina, um, I don't know how much of that is taking hold as it might be in other states at, at this moment in time. Right. There was a large turnout yesterday yes. for uh, the first day of voting, which typically I think is maybe the largest uh, day other than maybe a Saturday. But uh, I, I think we're going to see yeah. large, uh, a lot of interest and a large turnout. You know, this morning I heard Steve Adams um, say something on the radio, and he's going to be our guest in the second part of the show. And he was talking about the turnout as well. Mm -hmm. And he said, and this is a question that is on everyone's mind, is it a blue wave? Is it a red wave? Right. We don't know. Um, obviously, in 2016, it was um, a red wave. Right. Um, what does red and blue become? Purple? If you <laughs> yeah. blend them? Okay. Um, maybe it's going to be a little bit of both. We don't know. Um, and I think it'll vary from area parts of the country to parts of the country, obviously. Frank, if people want to um, get on your website, um, is it... Um, Let's see, McNeilforCongress.com? That's correct. And that McNeil and then the number four, Congress.com. Dot com. That's correct. And um, they'll be seeing your TV ads and um, uh, hopefully paying attention. One last quick question. Any important endorsements you want to share with us? Let's see. Um, Steny Hoyer uh -huh. uh, endorsed uh, the... G.K. Butterfield, mm -hmm. congressman here in North Carolina. David Price, congressman. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, mayor of Fedville, Mitch Colvin. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Who else? Uh, <laughs> Family members? No. My biggest booster is my dad. If you have anybody uh -huh. that's spent any time with my dad yep. since uh, February, uh You've left having to say, "I will vote for him." Get him on. He, the he won't turn campaign. you. He won't turn you loose until uh, until that happens. Frank, we want to wish you the best of luck in the next couple of weeks. Bill, thank you so much. It's a pleasure it's been to great see you. Be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure, and we'll um, we'll look forward to seeing you down the road. Sounds great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we're going to be back in the second set, and we're going to be speaking with one of the candidates for sheriff in Moore County, Steve Adams. Um, this is all things Moore County. We'll be right back. Welcome back to um, the second part of our show today. Um, uh, we're talking about the election in general. We're talking about a couple of candidates. Um, we just spoke with Frank McNeil running for Congress in the 8th District. In this set, we're going to be speaking with Steve Adams, who is, um, from what I can see, the only independent, non-affiliated well, um, Officially unaffiliated. Officially unaffiliated. Yeah, that's what's on the ballot. So, I got... Um, so in Moore County, we have 67,900 registered voters. 27,500 are Republican. 16,500 are Democrats. 23,500 are unaffiliated. Um, what you mentioned on the radio, your radio show early this morning was, is it a blue wave or a red wave? Yeah. And that has a lot to do with the 23,500 people, doesn't it? Yeah, I, that and... Uh, in my case, the um, Democratic candidate pulled out, so right. we're vying for those Democratic votes, too. So why are you officially unaffiliated? Well, it started out— You're the only one in the, in the field of 39. If I had run Republican, which I'm registered, right? Um, the candidacy is unaffiliated. Okay. Okay, so— if I had run on the Republican ticket, there would have been three of us, and vying for the uh, for the pool there. And I think our current sheriff, who got beat, um, part, primarily due to the efforts we have been making against him for the last three years, mm -hmm. and brought to light the incidents that he had uh, without rehashing them, right, um, to to the forefront, and that's what people voted against. They just wanted they wanted to get rid of him, so they did. But had I been in there diluting the pool, 
with with what I could have drawn drawn over, then I think he would have won because he he turned out to have like I think forty six percent, which was yeah. solid base for him. Correct. Um, so all he would have needed was would be four more percent. Yeah, the question about your affiliation it came up. Uh, I heard a an interview you had um, earlier, I think, in this week uh, about your independent stance. Um, and uh, but th with the Republican field so crowded, you thought that it would be um, better for you to position yourself without either party. Yeah, if I had run Republican, then yep. uh, our current sheriff would be the nominee, okay. in my opinion. Okay, uh, I don't, he had a solid base of about forty-eight percent, and that wasn't going to go away. So he, all he needed to do was gather four percent, and if I was in there diluting the pool down, right then uh, he would have won. All right. In the first set, when speaking with Frank McNeil, we were talking about some ads that were being sent out in another race that was appealing to, you know, the lowest common denominator. They weren't truthful. They were kind of slanderous. And that kind of rhetoric was very negative. But those candidates are trying to paint a big picture difference. Right. What I see... Um, about the big picture of this race, um, and we had reached out to Ronnie Fields to to come and join us, and he, uh, I didn't hear back from him. Yeah. So the big picture that I hear from different people is it's a question of um, experience because your background and his background seem so different. Right. Well, I don't want to say anything bad about my opponent. We've kept this race yeah. above board. And yeah. We haven't been slanderous toward each other. No, so, you have not. Um, when I refer to him, it's not in a slanderous way. Sure. But um, the experience question, uh, let me uh, answer it this way. There's one man in this county that more people trust their health care to than all the doctors, nurses, and health care providers combined. Do you know who that man is? I do not. His name is Dave Klarsky. Does that ring a bell? David Klarski. Uh, yes, it does ring a bell. Yeah. He's the CEO of First Health. That's right. And when you go in First Health, he provides you with the best doctors, the best nurses, best equipment, best atmosphere to get well in. Right. He's had many accolades and awards presented to him. And, but he and I have three things in common. We're both great managers. We're both have impeccable integrity. And neither one of us has a medical degree. So, that's okay. what I'm coming at with this this department. It needs management. We always put someone in there who's never managed anything and stick him on the train. Well, the best thing he can do is just keep it on the tracks and keep doing it the old bureaucratic way. Mm -hmm. And what I'm proposing is to, to get us off those tracks. And, and, and literally, over the course of, of my term, uh, transfers to where the sheriff's department will be uh, self-sustaining in other words we can bring in as enough revenue to pay for ourselves so it doesn't it's as the zero burden on the taxpayer then that money can be used however the commissioners feel toward paying off bonds or building new schools or um, whatever you know highest on their priority I mean they would have the say as to where the money goes but you'll never see a bureaucrat do what I'm going to get ready to tell about because and I don't say bureaucrat in a, in a derogatory way. It's just they think differently from right. private enterprise. Right. I'm private enterprise. I, right. You're private enterprise. That's correct. You and I think a lot different than a bureaucrat. That's right. And the bureaucrat looks at it, well, this is extra work. It doesn't pay me extra. I have no interest. Let me give you a list why it won't work. Right. That's their way of thinking. It's just automatic in them. And it's... It's um, but a, a private enterprise guy goes, wow, this is a pretty cool challenge. Uh, let me see if I can make this work mm -hmm. within the budget, and maybe even make it profitable to the taxpayer. Right, and that's the angle I'm coming at. Uh, the plan starts out with the first thing we got to have is a crime lab. Now I got, um, I've been telling you I can put a crime lab in at for no added cost to the taxpayer. And the next question becomes. How are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a logical question. Well, they've done it in Cumberland County. They put one in for two hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars a year, and it's not. You don't. We don't put it in ourselves. We contract with a company that comes in, who's already accredited, who already has the equipment accredited, 
and they put it in. Mm-hmm. We have space for it in the um, uh, Rick Ryan Detention Center, but we don't have the equipment nor the accredited personnel. They provide all that and for a contract price. And they've done it in Forsyth County also, and it's working out. And the net effect of that is right now we're being played by the criminals. What happens is let's just say a big drug dealer gets caught. And one of two things are going to happen when he's arrested. He's either going to go free on bond or he's going to sit in, on our nickel in our jail right. for three years. Right. Because right now, all the evidence goes to the state crime lab. And if you have more than 10 pieces of evidence, that's all you can submit on one case per month. So if he has 50 pieces of evidence, it takes five months just to get it submitted. Okay. Then you got to wait for all that to come back. That takes six months to two years. And then you got to have the guy who tested it in the courtroom on the day of the trial. And by the time all the calendars come together between the DA, the courts, and the defendant, you got three years into this. And with a 74% turnover rate of personnel at the sheriff's office, that pretty well guarantees you the deputy will not be there, the witnesses will not be there. The best the DA can do is offer up a plea deal. But this all takes around three years. And there's no justice for the citizen. And it works in the opposite way, too. If you're innocent, you sit for three years unnecessarily when we can get our own results back in two to three days with our own crime lab. So uh, in the case of DNA, it takes a little bit longer than that. But still, we get it back in a reasonable amount of time, and we can get the cases to the judge in the courtroom in three months or less. That will reduce the amount of people being held Mm -hmm. by 74%. Because if you look it up online of the of the. Right. Prisoners that are there, 74% of them have been there three years or longer. And we're not talking about the murder cases. They take longer. That's excluding those. It's 74%. So you get to reduce your jail population by 74%. That gives you a lot of inventory to do the math for you. Be at 122 um, open cells that then could be leased out. And the going rate's anywhere from 100 to $575 a day. So you can get anywhere between four and twenty-five million dollars a year coming back in. Now people are seeing in the paper and other places that, uh, oh well, the commissioners passed a resolution, but back when they built the Rick Ryan Center, that uh, uh, they won't lease it out. Well, they've already leased it out uh, to the state uh-huh. on a couple occasions. Uh-huh. And one of the commissioners said to me, um, he said, he said. Uh, we sure when they stop the state stop leasing uh, our jail cells. He, he said we sure miss that money. Mm. It was a good revenue coming in, mm-hmm. and uh, the director of prisons, um, uh, his name slips me right this moment. Okay, but he he said that uh, this is a no brainer. If you got empty cells, you need to be leasing them out. There's no use letting them sit there empty. Right, and and this is the this is the. Uh, center point of what I plan on doing at the at the uh, sheriff's office, in addition to a thousand other things. But this is what will bring the revenue in, right? Uh, and so that uh, you're not always strapped for money. And the second thing I want to do is with the commissioners, okay, with the first two point one million I bring in, is to raise the salary of the deputies. We got good deputies, but we lose them. Thirty-four percent turnover rate per year. That's a lot. Yeah, that's high. That's high. And is it all based on um, their compensation? I would say not. There's other problems in there. You got morale. Well, yeah, but you got you got um, uh, an innocent men in an offensive way, but the good old boys in there. And I got letter after letter after letter from deputies that have written me mm-hmm. and say that they they you know new new uh, deputies come in they train them and then the good old boys promote them over them they never get promoted one lady said she i was stuck on night shift for 10 years training never got a single promotion in 10 years you know either you promote them or you get them out the door if there's something wrong with them yeah but uh and i talked to another person in the jail and he was te- uh, a detention officer. He was telling me that he wrote everything down, 
everything that was every, if he was told an order he wrote it down what time who gave it because when uh he says if they don't if they want to get rid of you they'll set you up to get rid of you mm -hmm. they will um become your friend take you to the bar party and guess what the blue lights are waiting on you when you leave mm -hmm. and they'll do whatever it takes to get you out if they don't like you mm -hmm. um and that needs addressing. That needs that needs um, rooting out. Yeah, you know, as I'm listening to you speak, I don't understand why um, the sheriff's race or a judge's race. Why they even have to denote political party? My, it should be a nonpartisan position. It really yeah. should be yeah. um, because um, it, it almost limits um, people's uh, view. Uh, we had um, uh, Regina Joe on, um, right, and through judge. Judge Regina mm -hmm. Joe, yes. She was on um, an earlier show, and through the redistricting and the gerrymandering and everything, she is now um, being forced to run in a county where she was not um, right. running or working before. Um, Same for her opponent. Her opponent has to run in that right. county. That's correct. Um, so, um, but I don't understand why it's political, and it's almost like why should the judges – be candidates right. and why should sheriff uh, you, you and ronnie be it's not a political thing i think with the judges they 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 think they're making that what is it, the constitutional amendment they own the ballot there are ballot. a couple of yeah. six of them um that they are wanting the, the the party by them because judges can't render a preference of opinion or much of anything on the record right you know because they may have to rule on it That's so basically correct. they can say i'm going to follow the constitution i'm going to Right. Um, ruled by the law, and that's about all they can say. That's what everyone says. So they're sticking the party affiliation bond to let you know which what their leanings are, I guess. Yeah. One of the things um, I've noticed uh, about your campaign, too, is um, an emphasis on a, a no-kill shelter. Um, yeah. I'd love you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, the naysayers will always say there's no such thing as a no-kill shelter. You know, I hear all the un, the people who aren't fully educated on what the kill shelter, the no kill shelter is, express an opinion before they know all the facts. Right. And the, here's the facts of ours: um, almost well, two thir a third of all the cats and a quarter of all the dogs, and that's an understatement, are, are euthanized at that shelter. And it's a lot of cats and dogs every year. And they don't euthanize them humanely. Right. Um, you've had people on this show talk about that. We have, yes. Uh, and but the definition of no-kill shelter is that no healthy or treatable animal will be put down to make space. Uh, the only ones that will be euthanized are those that are uh, terminal mm -hmm. and those that are a danger to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones that are put down. But all the others, if they're treatable and and um, healthy, they don't get put down. Now, they say, okay, well, you're going to run out of space. Well, that's where the volunteers have to come in. Now, right. I've got three radio stations I can help recruit volunteers with. i got organizations already right. that are supporting me that will uh, help come and rescue the dogs out. I've had one, one lady with one of the biggest organizations here rescue organization says i won't go to that animal shelter because she says i went there and i told him i she says i filled my truck up with dogs mm -hmm. and i told him i'll be back friday to pick up that last dog to don't let anything happen well the vet tech there immediately took the dog out back and euthanized it mm -hmm. just kind of show her who was boss and that's the attitude there to help at the animal clinic that i'm gonna fix right because no dog is going to see the needle if they're healthy. They're safe. Right. Now, we got to limit our intake to just more county because that's, you know, we're limited on space. Another thing we're going to do is um, extend our hours. We're going to be open until 9 p.m. at night mm -hmm. so that people can come after work and not close at the bureaucratic time of 4 p.m. Um, and we're also going to um, train every dog, get them socialized. And how are we going to do that? We're going to... Um, recruit the volunteers to work with every dog every day and also i'll put them in the jail cells with the inmates on the leash under supervision obviously to um work with these dogs and uh, they got nothing else to do all day nope. they might as well 
do something that benefits the public. And if you get a dog, one of the biggest problems with the, uh, adopting an animal when you get it home is not anything like you thought it would be. Right. But if they could understand commands of sit, stay, um, lie down, uh, yeah. be quiet, just simple commands. We're not going to make a service dogs. That's a big program. But uh, it makes the dog a lot more adoptable. As a layman, um, I never associated um, uh, the sheriff's position with the no-kill shelter. I didn't even I didn't realize that that fell under the auspices of the sheriff's office. Well, it didn't until 2017 here. Okay. They have, were having a lot of problems with the person that was in charge of the shelter. Uh-huh. And a lot of the rescue groups just got to the point they would not work with her. And the volunteers would You're talking about the shelter in Hope County? No, here. Oh, here. Okay. Here. Okay. And um, it just got to a point that um, they said, well, let's put it under the sheriff's domain. Uh, okay. So it wasn't under the, the domain before right. that. Right. Okay. All right, so I'm not as much of a layman as I, I so thought. So it changed for the better for a while. It's very clean. Yeah. I'll give it its kudos where it's good. I mean, they, it's extraordinarily clean there all the time. But um, when rescue groups won't come and help rescue these animals out, well, you're doing something wrong, and you need to fix it. Right. And it's not being fixed, and I will fix it. Gotcha. Um one of the talking points, um, and to me it's, it screams out, the root cause of 90% of all crimes, drugs? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the crime is. If you dig deep enough, drugs are in there somewhere. Um, wow. It's the biggest killer of, of uh, our children and our families. And when somebody's on drugs, it not, doesn't just affect them. It affects the whole family because they'll first mm -hmm. steal everything they got. Right. They will steal everything their family's got, and that's then they'll go to their neighbors and start taking it from them. Mm -hmm. It's a great uh, redistribution of wealth program there is, except the bad guys get all the money. Right. And right. the bad guys will, oh, you don't have any money today? Here, I'll give you some, give you some on credit. Mm -hmm. And then they press them to pay up, and that's when things start getting stolen, and people start getting hurt and robbed. So it goes down as a robbery, but it was a drug crime. Gotcha. And and uh, the gotcha. root cause is in there. Okay. Um, so right. we got to we got to stop them. We got we got to we know who the drug dealers are. Uh, I've talked to enough deputies. We know who they are. So why are we wasting our time on things like checkpoints and the like when we got bigger fish to fry than somebody didn't carry their license that night? Right. And plus, I don't think it's right that you can't, Bill Sahadi can't go home without being asked for his papers. Right. That just goes against my grain. Right. And we will not participate in those anymore. Right. Uh, we will get the drunk drivers. We will get the, the uh, criminals off the road. There's a lot of things you can observe about somebody just by following them. Right. If they're driving too perfect, they're probably hiding something. Yeah. Especially when they're in a beat up car. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, that might sound profiling, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. And get these kids off of the cell phones and everything else. But you can't do that at a checkpoint. Right. All that's doing is being a bully. And I don't like it. You know, again, as a layman, I remember back in 2008 uh, being in the real estate business. Our area took a turn for the, uh, the worse. Uh, values dropped. Um, and we know, I noticed uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, there was a pickup in crime. Mm -hmm. um, in communities that had never had it before. And so I always thought that the economy was one of the main drivers uh, with crime. Th that hasn't changed, has it? Uh, it's definitely a factor. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, as people's monies dry up. Yeah. Uh, if they're on the drugs, then they, they got to go get that money somehow. And that's when they start attacking the community for their for their habit yeah you know and one other thing i want to work in here if i can is sure. my background um uh when i was 27 i borrowed twenty five thousand dollars, and i turned it into one of the largest home building companies in the state of north carolina i was in wake county at the time and i built over two thousand houses there and i did all that within six years of my start started with three houses and and when i was six years later i had over 100 at a time going and I built a lot of houses, and you do you can only do that by being a great manager. 
today in today's world with the banking and the Dodd Frank and all that, don't think I could accomplish that. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. back then, we didn't have Dodd Frank. We had other Dif- issues, different like, regulations, like usury laws, and yeah. I had to fight twenty one and a half percent prime interest rates. Right, you had to go out and buy mortgage money down for your buyers to buy a house. That's right. You know, crazy things that you were forced to do to survive. Right. But good managers could survive. I didn't leave the building business because I was forced out. I, I left on my own terms. Right. I just got tired of all the regulations on me and the inspectors who didn't have any skin in my game. Right. You know, telling me how I had to spend every dollar. It got And they started trying to micromanage me. And I said, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. You'll find some other fools to do this. I'm not doing it anymore. And I said, I'll go do something else. And I did. You know, one of the um, topics of past shows have been keeping kids in school, mm. keeping them off the streets, keeping them um, motivated and putting them on taxpayer rolls because the antithesis of that is they get in trouble, they go down different um, alleys, um, drugs being one of them. And um, in addition to the six constitutional amendments that are on this year's ballot, there is um, the quarter cent sales tax. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, back in May, the bond referendum passed, uh, the county commissioners have been 100% behind it. And the quarter cent sales tax is something, um, uh, on their Facebook page, it's pennies for more. That's pennies, F O R more, um, building the infrastructure benefits people of all ages, not just people who have kids in school. Mm-hmm. Um, because it helps increase property values. Um, it helps, hopefully, from a sheriff's point of view, keeping the kids in school so that they become um, good citizens and and not the underbelly of what y- you would have to be dealing with on a, on a well, daily basis. You know, when I was in 12th, well, in high school, yeah, um, an FBI agent came and they had a whole school assembly. And then it still has an impression on my on me that of the uh, uh-huh. story he told, and he told basically um, what life is like for a felon yeah. versus a citizen, right? And how you become a second class citizen if you have a felony on you, and how mm-hmm. easy it is to get a felony on you. Carrying around one Xanax pill is a felony. Right. Um, these are the things that, uh, and I plan on being developing a program for every school level and we'll where we'll be in the schools every year and talking about these things and about drugs and uh right uh how easy it is to, to get on them but how hard it is to get off i'll bring prisoners in whatever it takes to shock these people a little bit to right to uh try to scare them away well having a good school system and having a school system that is uh accommodating the needs of the citizenship um is is a first step in keeping everybody on the straight and narrow. Yeah, and it's uh, it's in our Moore County. It's jobs. And parenting and schools. is another thing. Uh, parents yeah. have to do their job and be parents. Yeah, that's true. Um, I know my father. You were talking about kids hanging out. Yeah, he wouldn't let me hang out. Yeah, you know, if I had a purpose to be there, I yeah. was allowed to go there. Uh-huh. But I couldn't just hang out because when you hang out, there's only trouble. one thing to do. Right, get in trouble. Right. Where can uh, people go to? Um, Find out more information about um, about you and it's your easy. candidacy. Yeah. Okay. AdamsforSheriff.com. The capsulated version is right there on the front page. And yeah, it's pretty intuitive. If you want to get uh, deep into it, it goes very deep. It's Stephen Adams on the ballot. Steve, it's right. Just remember Adams. Just remember. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, early voting is happening, um, and you anticipate 60% of the voters are going to be voting prior to election day? That's the statistic that the Board of Elections gave me. Wow, um, that's hot. They said it's great. Last last time, sixty percent of the votes were in the last election were cast yeah. before election day. Yeah, it's it's a, a vibrant election season for sure, more so than any midterm I can ever remember. Wish you the best of luck, Steve. Thanks for uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Bill. Okay, um, we are going to transitionalize next week. Uh, we have a couple of other shows coming up that are actually not going to be related to the elections, but we'll talk with you next week. This is all things Moore County. Thank you.